Welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Ian Rapnicki from the DIA. Today's studio visit is with visual artist Avery Williamson. Williamson is a multidisciplinary artist whose work explores historical and contemporary notions of the archive, black pleasure, and spatiotemporal collapse. Her body of work includes textiles, murals, collage, photography, and painting. She graduated from Harvard College with a degree in visual and environmental studies. And she currently lives in and works in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Uh, today, she'll be in conversation with DIA studio coordinator, Zach Freeling, and he'll take your questions throughout the program. If you are watching on YouTube and you'd like to ask a question, just make sure you're logged into your account and then you can leave a comment. If you're watching on Facebook, you can leave a public comment there as well, and we'd love to hear from you. But now let's visit with Avery and Zach. Hi. Thanks, Ian. Hi, Avery. How's it going? Good. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks. Glad to have you here on this nice uh, sunny day. Excited to look at some of your work and talk about it. Um, so we can dive right in. Um, as Ian mentioned, you're a multidisciplinary artist uh quite a few things there um, but we're going to talk about collage mostly today we'll look at a few other things so i wanted to start us off looking at um this collage here but before we dive into the work could you just tell us a little bit more about uh more about yourself more about your background yeah absolutely so um i'm based in ypsilanti and uh, I work in a lot of different media and I think about my art as a way to process the world and I'm constantly considering new materials and, and ways to make and to make sense of this time. And I'm really excited to be talking about the collage work because that has been something that I've been very drawn to lately. And um, there's a lot of different ideas that I'm working through, different places that I'm sourcing the material in my work. Um, this is one of my favorite collages that's up on the screen, and it's in, uh, inspired by a photograph that I found from my grandparents' wedding, and it's a, a photo that I return to again and again. I've given it almost every treatment of the type of work that I make, whether it's collage or bringing in glitter or just drawing and doing some sort of printmaking. Um, so I'm excited to just talk about how I use materials and how I'm thinking about my work right now. And I'm also excited to share some in progress work uh, later in the call too. That's great, thank you. That's, that's lovely too, that it's you know based on a, a family photograph. We talked a bit earlier and we'll talk more later about where you source all these images from, um, but that's nice that you're kind of combining um, sort of stories in general, but also specific relating to you and your family making it making it pretty personal yeah and this one i love just all of the different textures and brush strokes you can see and it's got such a nice painterly quality um, and a lot of depth to it um, which sometimes can be tough to do in a collage but it still has that that uh, nice cut paper and material quality to it yeah i made this collage in 2020 um, and that's when i started to bring a lot more color into my collages the earlier collages were black and white and I was lifting and kind of mixing and matching from different photographs, taking people, primarily relatives from different locations in the past, different um, facades were in the background. They were kind of bending time and that they were maybe people from two different branches of my family tree who would never or had never been in the same place or the same country. And uh, this was a time where I was trying to move towards like a zero waste or low waste studio practice. And so I had some works on canvas, I would say more experiments that hadn't worked in their initial vision, but I really loved the marks and I loved the colors. And there was something about the energy that I felt like I couldn't part with. And so I kind of started to collect and categorize these different colors and marks. And then I kind of matched that up with the photographs that I was revisiting again and again, and was feeling like they needed to have a new treatment, they needed color. Um, so this piece has kind of some of the squiggle marks that I've used. Um, there's a bit of um, an interior, an unsuccessful interior drawing that has found its way into this piece. And I wanted to think a lot about like sky and foliage and growth and kind of the garden of of life when I was working on this piece. 
Okay. The term growth, what kind of applies to, like it sounds like that's, there's growth in the physical practice of the work, the way it's grown and changed. There's growth in the way it relates to nature. There's growth in, you know, the way it's relating to the family. I like this a lot. And I like that. I think in one of the emails earlier when we started chatting, you said that you've been really excited about collage lately. And I liked that's stuck with me a lot. I think that's great to, you know, be able to keep that personal excitement going about work. And I think it really shows with the, the marks you make and the colors you use. And I liked this collage a lot as well, that it's starting to um, show some dimensionality, how the paper's maybe not all the way pressed down flat. You can see some of the shadows, you can see some depth. Yeah, um, this was kind of early in that series of reduced waste or zero waste. And I was bringing in these characters that had formerly been in these black and white spaces. And uh, as you can see in the title, making ourselves at home in someone else's utopia, I was starting to think about, again, that spatio-temporal collapse or kind of these portals or other worlds. And I think this was also at the beginning of the pandemic and really feeling very confined to one space and just kind of feeling like imagination was the best way to survive or to keep kind of my sanity intact as things seem to be unraveling in the exterior world. And so that really was informing these collages of really considering alternative worlds, alternative ways um, in which you're kind of not locked down to the reality or the constraints of the present moment. And I also, I generally don't glue or tape the collages permanently. Like I really like them to be fluid. I like to reuse the parts that I like. I don't like my characters to be stuck there. Like I store them in a separate special box from the other collage bits because I like them to like play and move and go places. I really feel like I have a relationship to them and um, an obligation to give them exciting spaces to be in, to look at. That's great. Yeah, I think we've got some more examples of that. I like this collage a lot as well, um, kind of growing from what we've seen with the other two and kind of breaking free of that um, rectangular shape. And I think, you know, what you were just saying about having the characters, the, the figures be free and, you know, not glued down, not stuck, not even necessarily on the, the page, but still part of the artwork. Um, and also this one incorporates some natural materials, which goes well with, um, you know, you mentioned zero waste, which is, um, we could probably spend a whole hour talking about, you know, utilizing no waste in artwork. Um, but I think, especially during, you know, the past two years, that's something that, you know, seems more uh, poignant with, you know, kind of using what you have to make things that are new and, you know, we found that a lot with a lot of our students when we were teaching classes online and, you know, not everyone could get out to the art store or go buy supplies, what kind of became a lot of, you know, looking around the house, seeing what comes in the mail, seeing what you've used before, but want to reuse. But the natural materials in this jumped out a lot. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, also, the the irregular shape. We'll talk a little bit later about Howardina Pendel and her work, but mm -hmm. I'm very inspired by kind of pushing the boundaries <laughs> of, of shape, like, yeah, um, literally. you know, yeah, like, I mean, like, you know, we're photographing through our phone, so there's going to be this rectangular square shape, but as I'm working, I'm really trying to get away from that and to have a lot more play, because again, when we're thinking about alternative worlds, like, why do they need to be confined to a rectangle? Like, mm -hmm. there's movement and play. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking about that a lot in the shape but here. Um, a friend brought back some moss from the Upper Peninsula and shared that with me in the studio, as well as rocks and twigs and other found material from walking around and hikes. And I was really excited about, um, I was and am excited about really kind of location and site specific palettes and pieces and, and thinking about um, dimension too and getting away from uh, these flatter works. And then the figures here are made out of polymer clay, which is a material that I'm familiar with um, because I, in the past, made a lot of jewelry and earrings and kind of had that um, tactile memory and language as like a material I could go to to form something. Um, and so I brought them in to this piece so that it had even more dimension, they had weight. And I also wanted to start to think about my figures kind of being more upright. So this was kind of a big, 
uh, a completed piece, but also an exploration that led me to going even in further directions. And then I think we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I did a residency, the Rabbit Island residency um, in the, up in the Keweenaw Peninsula. Um, so I was on um, an island in Lake Superior for two weeks solo making work. So I was really, really immersed in the palette there and was kind of posing and bringing my ancestor silhouette characters into that space and really animating them. And um, I was alone there like in in person, but I also kind of felt like having this these kin and these spirits with me was uh, actually really important to my practice and to kind of the the feeling less alone in in that experience. Then, um, that sounds great. First of all, that residency that sounds like a really uh, amazing time. Uh, you as you're saying about the figures, you know, kind of being characters or kin or you mentioned spirits. Um, is that something you felt had a strong feeling about like before this residency, or is that something that kind of came more to fruition or really developed in this time of uh, isolation? It's been a long going, like, I can't even really think of when I wasn't thinking about that. I mean, before I think I, in my art education, I kind of started out, started out more like in photo and taking photographs. And really my projects were around my family. It was about photographing my grandfather in the final years of his life um, and asking him questions and interviewing him. And then also in the absence of being able to speak and photograph in person these people, it was about research. So it was going into the archives, which I think of that very broadly as like, it could be the family album, it can be family heirlooms, it can be recipes. It's also what, you know, the, the US government has in our archives. Um, so it was really a diverse understanding of the archive. Um, so I just, I feel always that there's a responsibility to the people that I'm making work about. And so that, uh, exists when I'm sitting across from that person, but also when I'm working working with their image or their outline or their figure. So I really do feel a connection to these characters and really do think about where they go in the world with me and how I am portraying them and talking about them in the context of my work and the collages. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, I think, yeah, I think we will talk about the residency a bit more, but yeah, I love, I love this incorporating of the natural materials. I had no idea that those were that the figures were clay, uh, but that's that's really interesting. Um, was this your first time using clay with a collage or was that something that just kind of came about through experimenting in the studio or were you intentionally trying to bring in more materials? I think, well, I think if you notice, it's probably hard to see, but there's like a little hole at the top of one of the figures head. So I think I had originally kind of made these um, thinking that they would hang like it was like I was making earrings so I was thinking about like the hardware that connected the earrings and so I was kind of bringing that form and that way of adhering things together into that and I was thinking maybe I would make a mobile um, or I would have some these figures connected in some way so a lot of my work is about play and experimentation and sometimes I arrive at an unexpected location for that, like I thought it was going to be something else. And then I found that it worked really well in this situation. So I didn't go in with a strong intention there, but they found their way into this and felt that this was a good landing place. That's great. So when you have something like this, that's maybe, you know, you said the figures aren't necessarily entirely adhered. Is there a point when they are or when it's finished or is the photograph the finished piece or is the, um, action the final piece or i i am still asking myself this question and i think any day or week i might have a different answer yeah. right now i am actually doing some more gluing with my collages and committing um i have a hard time committing because i'm just like mm -hmm. never sure if that is exactly where this this friend ancestor um should ex should exist. Um, yeah. I think in the context of this piece, I photographed it, and that to me was the complete piece. Mm -hmm. I am interested. I mean, so much of the work that I've been making and sharing recently has been viewed online, 
And so there haven't mm-hmm. been as many in-person opportunities. So I feel like it's interesting in how you're asking the question that the depth and the material, it's hard to gather in the flatness of a photograph. And so I'm, I'm interested in the coming years to um, display these in person to give people the opportunity to understand the depth and dimension of the work. And uh, so I, I have a show that I'll show some work from later on, but that'll be a chance for the collages to be viewed in person. And I think it, it's really important for me, for people to see the work in person to really get the texture of it. Um, so I'm hoping in the future, they'll they'll get to live and be in the world where people can look at it and really understand how they operate. Yeah, cool. I totally get what you're saying though about to, um, you know, the committing, like I feel like, you know, I, I do a lot of collage and sometimes it's like, I've got this beautiful old mountain from a National Geographic or something, like I'm gonna glue this down and then that's it. So I'd imagine when you're dealing with actual people and relatives and memories and places, you know, it's it's that the scarcity of the object tied to, you know, what more it uh, it represents. Absolutely. I worked with um, an artist based in Detroit, Rachel Elise Thomas, who makes beautiful collages. And she did a portion of a group uh, mural at the Ann Arbor District Library. And um, we had some great conversations about process and kind of thinking about the delicacy or the uniqueness of individual pieces of the collages. And I believe that her practice includes uh, photographing or scanning in the materials and then digitally arranging that. And so I was really inspired by her process and have actually started to photograph work too, so that I can um, use it on my iPad and start to play with different compositions. And that's helped yeah. me get away from the fear of commitment yeah. of kind of putting pieces down. Mm-hmm. All right. And let's look at um, speaking of, you know, space and things not being glued down. Um, this is an animation, which I was kind of wondering about these two, if, if how these were displayed or if the idea is that it's a digital piece that just uh, um, is meant to be online or if you've ever thought about using monitors in a show or, or just could you talk a little bit about how you came to this, um, you know, starting to yeah. display animation? Yeah, I really love animation. That's something that I have gotten more familiar with in the past two years. and. Um, I have to say, I think it was an accident. <laughs> the first animation of kind of um, maybe clicking the wrong button and then starting to see these different versions I was playing around with in the collage stitched together. Mm-hmm. And I felt that, you know, it animated these characters obviously, but it brought about a new conversation between them and the space that was something that I did not yet know I needed to explore or to offer the space for them to speak in that way or to be alive in that way. And then it was also, you know, I like the humor, the language, the conciseness with which gifts communicate moments in culture, like the, the, sh- the brevity of that, but how much like in our understanding of memes, like all of that, um, really tell us a lot about culture. So mm-hmm. these are in the GIF, GIF format. And I think about just the, sh- the quickness of that, how much you can actually take away from it. So I, I felt that it was a really a correct form um, format for this moment of just quickness and sound bites and what we're looking at and just giving people a loop of something. I also feel that at the time I was making this and still now there's very much like a loopness to our lives right now. Like, obviously there's the rhythm, you wake up maybe you drink coffee, you like you eat, you go back to sleep, you do all that stuff. But I also feel like in the news cycles and what we're scrolling through, like that motion is really present. And so I wanted to be a reflection of the actual motions of the culture that I'm feeling. And so the collages just really fit in and they start to have their own language when they move from still to animated. And in this piece, the title is, you know them and you don't. And I feel like a lot, I think about that a lot in the context of family or working in the archives of you have these very fixed um, moments in time of understanding of someone, a name, where they were born, age and all of that. But that's really nothing in understanding how they move through the world. There's always gonna be some mystery when you've never shared space with them. And also Mm -hmm. individuals that are mysterious people and have interior lives. And so I felt that thinking about the back and the front of the figures and the different ways that they're obscured really made sense for the work and the conversations I was having. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it kind of does. I mean, keeping it animated, it kind of makes it does makes it does make it seem like a little alive, I suppose. Like there's still you know movement there, and it's it's not as yeah static. And I think we've got another one here, which another thing too about these animations that was interesting. Um, this one, when I first saw this at a glance, I assumed this was all a flat object, but then I noticed that actually it also was an animation. And then you can kind of see behind the figure that it's this whole little, there's so much depth there, this goes back quite a bit. It's like a little diorama. If you could talk about um, this for a little bit. Yeah, I was making the flatter collages. I won't really call them two dimensional because they still had dimension, but this mm -hmm. is more dimensional. And so I created a little scene for them where I was even using kind of the floor space of the diorama as um, a piece of artwork drawing that needed a new life. And then I was using foam and wood and wrapping that uh, with paper and canvas. And so there were kind of, there are multiple levels of depth. There's like a back wall and then there are pieces that are coming out. And this particular figure, I am i can't stop animating them because there's something about the sitting in the chair, the waiting, um, we'll show later on, um, there's a still image, but there's also a video that I, they didn't share. But this figure's legs move with the wind. like. Th this figure feels animated in a really special way. And so you can see in this animation, I started to think about um, really moving figures up. And you can see that my finger is in one of the um, scenes. And I yeah. initially, again, that was a mistake in a way, but then I felt that it was really important to keep it there because it is a reminder that my hand and my work and my eyes in this. I am gazing at my ancestors. You, we are gazing at the work completed here. And that felt like really important again to, um, for me also ethically to, rem to remind and remember and to make clear that these are ancestors that I am caring for. Um, it is my hand that is shaping their movement now. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like the inclusion of the hand and I like that that kind of breaks the wall between, you know, what is um, what's the artwork and what is real life, I guess. And where does that line exist or does it exist? Um, it reminds me there's a Benny Andrews collage, painting collage we look at a lot in the collection. And, you know, part of the it's a portrait of a collagist. The pants, these cargo pants are part of the artwork and it's an actual pair of pants glued onto it. And it always takes a bit for the kids to notice and then they'll start to say like oh the pants are real and then it kind of gets into like well is the other part of the painting not real is the you know it's 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 i don't know it's, it's, a, it's a fun discussion um and that reminds me of that a bit especially when this is so personal and it is your you know your family and your life it makes sense that you would have you know including yourself you know actually showing yourself that way um we had a comment here from uh gail watson smith who is has um been on this chat with us before who's a artist quite an artist herself she asked what is the size of the artwork i know you're going to show a bit more later but like what is the size of this one here this figure is um about 11 inches in length and probably like about four inches and then the diorama setup for this was um probably like an arm's length like my outstretched arm's length kind of in a wraparound so everything is like kind of doll size if that helps that was kind of i mean i love dolls and i love doll houses so um this was a, a form of play that i was familiar with this scale and this size and this creating of a little world that's great that's great yeah and then uh, and we'll be looking at uh, Avery will be showing some of you know some in process pieces and some things in her studio there after we wrap up the presentation. Um, and speaking of dimensionality, I thought this was a really neat piece too. That again, at first glance, I assumed it was a collage, and then I was like, oh, this is a photograph of a dimensional space with real plants and these cubes that you said these were two foot by two foot, so mm -hmm. kind of large. And this was a collaboration yeah. with another artist. Yeah, um, so this is from, uh, I think it was late 2020. Sue McCleary is a uh, floral artist, 
I think her work is sculptural. Um, we've collaborated a few times and we talked about a color palette. We talked about um, what was interesting us. And then we both worked in our respective studio spaces and materials together. And then we brought this work together. So we um, shot this in a, a studio space called Studio Studio in Ann Arbor. And it's a little hard to see, but um, Sue's work is hanging from the ceiling. Uh, I don't have any videos of it, but the wind was kind of animating those limes. Uh, there are mushrooms in there. Um, and it, it became a really fantastic moment. There's four large cubes, two of them are acrylic, so they're transparent. Um, and then there's a bunch of smaller cubes and there's uh, like a shipping tube that I painted and also brought in here to have something cylindrical. So I'm, I'm continually interested in bringing new materials in. So uh, I think collaborations are a great way to see how other artists work be introduced to their material practice to consider is that a material that I should explore and bring in or should I bring in a collaborator who has a lot of expertise like what's the line of um, play and experimentation and then somebody who does that full time and has a long history of understanding that type of material work but uh, I think that when I got to do this with Sue it really got me excited and thinking about site-specific with organic materials in my work. And so I think a lot about as collaborations as co-exploring and then figuring out kind of what comes next. So in my work, I'm really grateful when I get to work with other artists and uh, get to learn through observation. Yeah, great. Um, and I'm looking at the time we've got, we've got a lot more to look at in about a little over half an hour, but this is going great. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, this was the start of a few of um, three or four pieces here that kind of thematically looked to get looked similar to me that you said were a little bit earlier than the collages we've looked at before. Um, if you just want to talk quickly about, you know, this piece, gold portraits and um, the obscuring of the faces is one thing that's been a common theme um, in all the work we've looked at. If you could talk on that for a, a minute. Yes, this piece, um, the images are school pictures that I found in a family album. And on the back side, some of them were labeled of the year um, and the name of the person. And my grandmother had labeled those or the sender of the image had labeled them. Um, I think kind of scrapbooking an album is a bit of a lost art in these days, but I really appreciate the dedication my grandmother had to that kind of recording of moments in time. And so I put them in this grid and I use these gold pieces to obscure their faces. And I think a lot about privacy in my use of the archive and my responsibility in lifting these images without explicit consent from these people because I don't always know their name, they may not be alive. And so I think a lot about in the world of facial recognition and surveillance and just every time we upload anything, it gets tracked and categorized and I really want to push back against that. And I also want to give viewers the opportunity to look at and to contextualize and think through in their own mind, what age are these people? Um, what color is their skin? What part of the, where, where are they from? What part of the country are they from? Like you can get that without seeing the face and the skin. And I want that to be a part of the work, that question, that mystery and that privacy. This kind of moving from, so you said that those were um, family photos. Was this also a family photo or one from the archives or? This was one from the family album. Uh -huh. um, and this was a beach scene that felt really familiar to me because I've grown up going to the beach. And uh, so this is kind of some of the earlier collage work, but I was looking at the black and white photos, but then taking painterly marks and going over that photo. but like really trying to reflect the color palette that was underneath it um, and thinking about these family relationships and how much you can take about the relation of all these figures to each other, even in the absence of seeing the crispness of the photograph or the faces like a father, a mother and children, siblings. Um, so that kind of kinship, I really want to capture and the warmth of that photo, how warm it felt to me. Mm -hmm. 
Then we talked too a bit about um, your residency earlier, and I'm noticing these earlier uh, works here are kind of more monochromatic, the black and white photos with the gold compared to um, the palette and some of their more recent collages. Um, has that time in nature, your residency, um, affected that at all, or is that just something that came natural? Yeah, I've been moving towards embracing color, especially after spending time in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan this summer. I've been thinking about um, the palette, the marks, um, the textures of, of that region. And so I was kind of like meticulously categorizing that through pictures on my phone and then also sketching and kind of creating this library and palette color and thinking of what feels like a hundred different shades that, you know, one tree's leaves produce in the, you know, three weeks of a season change to think about uh, depending on the weather conditions, what Lake Superior looks like. Um, it really, it really changes. So I've been looking very closely at those gradations that appear in nature and thinking about bringing that into my work and then being very conscious of when I'm bringing a very bright color in and kind of understanding energetically what that's doing for the work, why I'm bringing it there. So for me, I love color and I'm really always trying to be more conscious of what is inspiring those color choices. Yeah, that's great. And we'll look again at some of the more recent work with some of those some of those colors. I really love your pale. And I want to point out too the the pieces behind you. Those are yours as well, correct? Yes, yes yeah, these are. So those are great. Um, and then one more animation one, which you talked a bit too about. Um, you know, telling a story with your photos as well or your images as well, um, and you know, starting to incorporate text a bit, right? Yeah. I've been, um, I think text is the big experiment of this year for me. And I started to explore it last year. I took a um, writing class through the Room project in Detroit, which was fantastic. Um, I really appreciated the community of that class. And so I've been trying to push myself when it comes to prose and poetry and think about narrative in my work and think about what it means to bring these figures into this space and put words on top, how I want those words to really sit um, in sequencing. So this is something that's very much on my mind and I'm constantly looking at the artists that are my main influences to see how they use text. And I'm such like a book person, a library person so there's some days where I'm just looking and just trying to see how other people are doing it to get closer to what feels like the right mix for me. Yeah. That's when, when you start saying that I wrote down in my notebook here, room question mark, and I was going to ask afterwards if you are familiar with the room project. Um, yes, so I, love their, I love their work. Yeah, they're great. Um, yeah, right down the street from us at the museum. Um, and yeah, and speaking of your influences, we're gonna get to that in a second too, but we had one more, um, I think just one more, yeah, one more for now. Um, this mural you did, which could you just talk about this really quick and whoops, and uh, yeah, tell, yeah, tell us about this mural. Yeah, I this mural was completed and installed in 2020 and it is 480 square feet and you can't really tell from this picture, but it's painted on aluminum composite panels that I painted in my studio horizontal. So each panel is 10 feet by four feet. So they're, they're pretty sizable. Um, so this was my first experience of translating a sketch into something that is way bigger than you know me and that I could physically do kind of all in one motion. I, I think it wasn't until the mural was up that I could see it all together because I didn't have a space where I could lie them all down. Um, so it's split into kind of three parts here. So there's maybe six inches between each panel. And so this was my first project um, creating public work, which was really different than making something kind of like 16 by 20 or eight by 10, something you can hold in your hand and look at and you kind of control where it goes. So we installed this mural and it was up and is beautiful. It's in a service alley in downtown Ann Arbor and uh, a truck actually damaged it at the end of last year, which is unfortunate, but I also like 
in public art, you put work out into the world, it becomes something that the public is going to engage with. It's living, it's an alley, it's a functional service alley for restaurants and businesses. On the other side, there's beautiful display of trash cans and kind of where people are dumping grease. So like it's art that is going to be of the people with the people. I think after I installed it, I went back or it was installed, I did not install it myself. And there was a gentleman urinating on the other side of the mural. And for me, like I totally had to have this experience of letting go of any ownership of your work when it goes into public. Um, so right now the mural's in the process of finding a new home. So hopefully soon, hopefully this year, it'll be up somewhere else that people and the public can go and experience. Right now it's in my studio and it, it pains me because when I really make public work, I want it to be out in the world. It's not for <laughs> me to look at exclusively. Yeah, that's a beautiful outlook on it. I mean, obviously it's terrible that a, a truck hit it, but you know, a part of, about it being part of the world that also seems to kind of fit in with your other work. Like I'm looking at this photo with the um, this orange traffic barrier there, which like I could see some artists, muralists or building owners, whoever saying like, oh, we get that away from this artwork, but it really, you know, fits in and the colors complement each other. And it's an interesting juxtaposition of shape. And it's interesting seeing how, you know, things like the, the gutters on the building or the windowsills or whatever, how those start to work with with the artwork in a yeah, sort of a complementary way. You know, I'm I'm glad to be sharing wall space with a graffiti artist. There's some graffiti to the left of that. And like oh, yeah. that all feels like exciting uh collaboration <laughs> to be with the traffic cones and the grease yeah. containers and all of that. I think that's the real like a realistic way to look at public art you're not controlling mm -hmm. the space but you're offering something up to it for others to engage and to make it yeah better. yeah that's a really nice outlook because you know if you want it to be in a controlled space that's kind of what galleries are for or right. your website is for or whatever yeah. um and i did want to talk a bit quickly i want to give you time to share um you know your work you have at your desk there but i wanted to talk quickly a bit about some of the um work in the collection and some artists that inspire you um firstly i wanted to just share this McLean Thomas piece, something you can feel, which is up on display at the museum. And this is an artist you had mentioned um, being inspired by. Yeah, I love McLean Thomas's work. I feel like whenever I'm standing in front of her pieces, I'm feeling awe and excitement. And like I don't even know where to rest my eye because there are so many exciting and beautiful parts in, of this work and texture and references even in the patterns that I'm looking at that are making me think of like my grandparents house or these you know the barbershop or these different spaces that I've been and I feel inspired when I look at that kind of work and it makes me think about crafting art and experiences that give people that I think that life is already very difficult and challenging and there's so many stresses but I like to think about my art as a way for people to really have a moment of pleasure and, and something to look at and to enjoy and not necessarily to escape but to consider different ways of living and being and processing and so I, I think about Thomas's work as just um, kind of like a north star in, in a part of the textural part of my practice and I remember seeing her work in which she had kind of built these different sets that were reflective of the dimension that you're picking up in these more two-dimensional pieces. And I remember kind of taking notes and going home and then in the next coming months, thinking about building that little tiny diorama for my work and for my collages and to think, how do I um, process and think about how I can do in my own words and my own visual language, something similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And if you haven't seen this piece um, in person, I recommend coming down. You can see in the description there that it's not just a, you know, it almost has a collage look to it, has a painting look to it, but also you can see, you know, it's got oil enamel and rhinestones and it's got all these little gems and jewels and it's just so, so stunning. And that, and that gallery, which is full of so much amazing work, this one just really, really pops. Um, and Lorna Simpson is another one who also has a lot of collage, but this was a, um, a nice print in our collection that I had actually not seen of some interiors. And I think just kind of reminded me a bit too of some of your work thinking about, you know, the black and white photo and also the interior spaces and kind of these personal spaces and areas. And then also that it's a print on industrial felt, which is pretty interesting. So I thought, yeah. thought that was a nice piece. And then this one you referenced earlier when you're talking about the different shapes and, you know, 
actually pushing the boundaries of past the rectangle and utilizing different different forms and shapes for for your pieces and also incorporating the the words and stories and you mentioned seeing uh Hardina Pindell at a show in Chicago I think it was yeah I feel like that's one of the show one of the shows I went to that really changed the work I was making encouraged me to experiment with different materials I think up until that point I hadn't really worked with canvas I felt mm. that that was something that was for painters who make rectangular paintings. And I saw that show and I was thinking about these organic shapes and these textures in this piece, there's stitching. Um, it's a really textured piece and it's really large. And so I started working with canvas. Um, some of Howardina Pindell's earlier work uses the grid, which is also something I do when I'm thinking about kind of a style of meditation painting that I've been doing. So this was just one of the shows where I felt so grateful to see the work and also um, a bit sad that I hadn't seen her work earlier in my career because it felt like it was just such um, such a clear connection and, and something that uh, really just clicked for me in my making process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one is also up on display um, at the moment. Definitely recommend coming to see it. It's, it's really, really impressive. And then Jacob Lawrence was another artist and this one, this is um, from the uh, John Brown series of prints that the DIA has. Um, and I like this because the, the blocky shapes and, you know, fields of color have kind of a collage or cut paper look, but this is actually a print. But I like, you know, there's similarities, but differences to your work, which is so painterly, but often actual cut pieces of paper or canvas or material. Yes, I, I love Jacob Lawrence's work. I love this particular piece. I love the way he was processing and telling stories of that moment and um, reflecting back to people, truths, um, encouraging questions about um, black life in this country. And I really love the migration series. I love the use of imagery and text and sequencing of that. And I, I have that book on my desk here and reference it a lot when I'm thinking about trying to figure out text and sequencing and thinking about my collages. So, um, you know, not, you know, every three months I'm revisiting these artists and trying to understand what messages they've left for me that I can pick up and uh, allow to influence what I'm working on at that moment in time. That's great. Um, and then I think we've got, we just got a couple more slides here. You have a couple of shows coming up, which we wanted to share too. Um, your, your website and Instagram where people can find more information on, you know, your work. You've got a lot of great work on your site and, you know, work people can pick up if they want, info on more shows, hopefully info on when that mural is going to be back up. But if you just want to talk a bit about this piece, which is a little bit different, kind of more like the ones behind you there, but this is going to be at a show up in um, Cedar, which is near Traverse City later, um, later this month, actually. Wow. Yeah, soon. I'll be installing that soon. But yeah, this show is called Between Seasons and it opens on the spring equinox. So it's really thinking about, um, these works are inspired by what I've been looking at uh, now and in the past, um, what it feels like to go through this shift in time and think about the emergence and the blooming that happens in the spring and kind of the morning that I feel like for me happens in the winter as I'm thinking about these seasons of darkness. So I'm very excited for this show and if people are around, it would be really awesome to see them um, in the equinox. Yeah, so if you're up around Traverse City or need an excuse to go, um, yeah, it sounds like a great exhibit. And how, how about how large is this piece? Is this similar to the ones behind you? This is 16 by 20 on wood panel. Um, oh, and that's the size I like to, to work with. Um, I like to work on paper and wood um, now. I mean, who knows what I'll do next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but right now, that's been what I've been drawn to. Cool. And then you had another show coming up um, even sooner next Thursday opening. So I assume you're heading out to uh, install that soon. And this is some of the more recent work, correct? Yeah, so this is some of the more recent collage work. There's going to be interior paintings on wood panel in that show, and then also these works on paper, um, which have really been exciting me. And I'm gonna share a little bit of work in progress, but I've been really drawn to figures in motion in some of the other pieces, you can kind of see that the figures are posing for the camera. It's a bit of a more formal looking um, relationship. And I've been thinking a lot about people 
in complete moments of kind of absorption in, in what they're doing. Um, I've been looking in the Ann Arbor District Library archives a lot, uh, you know, where I am living right now. And um, thinking about kids just doubling over in laughter and having fun and playing and just thinking about that joy and the release and being unbothered, that has felt like a really important thing for me to look at and to, you know, explore in my work. So um, I'm really excited about these collages. These are like uh, nine by 12 and then 11 by 14. So they're at a smaller scale, but um, I'm really excited for people to get to see these collages in person. There's so much going on. I could look at these for forever. The colors are so great. I love these uh, plant drawings you've added to, which are something a little different than all the work we've looked at today, but also fit right in in a, in a nice way. Um, and then the last one I think we had was this this fellow again from the earlier animation. So this is a good example of, you know, is this the, the, is this physically the same one from the animation? Yes, it's the same okay. one. And this is um, from the Rabbit Island residency. So this is some of the stone that's um, in the northern part of Michigan. This stone is um, a lot more visible. It, it's very, I was very surprised to see it. I kind of felt like going to the Upper Peninsula which is so different and the, the palette, the texture, what I was seeing. Um, so this was on one of my walks around the island and I had kind of perched this ancestor there and uh, the wind kind of animated his feet in this moment, but uh, I would kind of take my backpack and have you know like some snacks and a drink and bring my ancestors with me on these hikes. And that was really a special way to kind of bring them into this experience. Yeah, that's a nice a nice argument for not gluing them down. I think being able to capture yeah. these kind of kind of nice nice moments. Um, we had a question from Molly M here saying, "How do you show your works on paper? Are they covered with glass?" I guess that might apply to even the ones on wood as well, with paper elements on them. Yeah, that's a good question. That I would say is a question I'm asking myself. I mean, even last week I was like, "Well, how should I show these works on paper?" Um, for the upcoming show uh, in at Court Gallery in Virginia, the collages are going to be framed with glass. Um, Nastasia Swift, who's the other artist who's in that show with me, we both had a long discussion about whether we wanted to frame the work, whether we wanted it to be behind glass. And I think we both committed to wanting to continually explore that in our work, but for the show, they're going to be behind glass. But I've been looking at how artists who do collage work are thinking about that work. And I've seen artists pinning work. I've seen um, kind of beading in there and different dimensionality all behind glass for kind of safety and protecting the work, but I'm interested in challenging it. I just haven't figured out how yet. Mm -hmm. Well, with that being said, I think we're now going to um, pull down the, um, the PowerPoint here and let you show some of your work that you have at your desk there um yeah. these last 10 minutes or so so if you have any questions feel free to um add them and we've got some other comments here from byron saying it reminds me of the copper harbor area up there gail mm -hmm. commented asking about meditation painting which i definitely can see that that vibe in your paintings um both in creating them and looking at them um but yeah why don't you show us um some of the you got some work in process i believe yes i have a very messy desk but you can't see all of that but i will um show some bits and pieces. These are, um, you kind of saw in one of the other collages, this is the, the group of school children in a circle playing that I um, found recently in the archive and just was feeling really drawn to. And then I also have these dancers um, that I've been looking at. Um, and some of these I sourced from kind of local Detroit events from the past that I've been able to find online. And I just feel like so excited about these characters moving in this way. So for me, my process is kind of printing these um, characters out and then I go through with pencil and marker and think about different ways that I'm like, thinking about the line work. I'm also obscuring their faces um, and I'll make like even 10 copies. I'll think about different size and scale. I'll try to figure out the right copy fidelity or texture that makes sense. Some of them are more saturated. Some of them are lighter. I like the degrade, degradation of, of kind of the simple studio copy machine in these. Um, and I've just really been liking to 
thinking about people outside of the gaze, outside of the pose, like kind of just having a moment, this um, young person is tying their shoe and not looking at the camera. And that feels really interesting and important to me in a moment where we are very much looked at. Um, and then see, these are some of the interiors that I've been working on. For my process, I source interiors a lot of times from like interior, like magazines or architectural digest. Um, I have them here and I have like lots and lots of bookmarks of um, scenes that I come upon that I feel drawn to that I feel like it's important to, to show. Um, and then I start to sketch and then I go back and forth with paint and colored pencil and marker to build up the layers of the pieces. And um, these are all in progress. So I kind of go back and figure out the details that I like thinking about depth and how many rooms or how much space I, I feel like is important to the piece. And I like to work on a lot of different pieces at a time so that as I get stuck or unsure about color or um, texture wise, I'm not kind of laboring too long over one piece, but I can move. And then I feel like oftentimes when I resolve something in one piece, I have an insight that helps me come back to another piece and um, figure out what needs to happen. And I, I think uh, I've been thinking a lot about pinks and greens. For me, I'm thinking a lot about the seasons and blooming and kind of the hope that those colors elicit for me. So I feel like that's been showing up a lot lately. And then again, just like these dancers and figures kind of having these really kind of playful moments has been really special. And then I usually kind of play around with the figures in different works and it'll take um, like a couple of weeks for me to figure out if it's the right room, if it's the right person and maybe I'll adjust size, maybe I'll pair them um, and I let with them sit for a while, look at them, come back, work on something different. So that's kind of how I figure out what belongs where. That's great. Thanks so much for, for showing those. So that's basically the, the type of work that you're working on for the, the show in Virginia coming up, yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah, so that's been good. And then I'm also always working on probably three things at a time. So there's also some paintings on wood panel and usually I'm just putting everything on tables in the floor in my studio and kind of setting like maybe 45 minute increments of when I shift from, you know, collage work to painting to whatever kind of com computer work I need to do or writing. And that kind of like rotation is really mm, good for how gotcha. my brain works. Yeah, I was gonna ask about, I asked about that. Cause you know, we mentioned at the beginning, you're a multidisciplinary artist. You do painting and collage and fibers and jewelry and photography and murals. So I was wondering what your, um, your average like studio day might look like, but that answers that pretty well. But I was wondering if, yeah, you kind of go in and you're all in on collage for a week at a time, or if it's bouncing around day to day. And, you know, when you find time for the business side of things and research and, you know, whatever else it might, might entail. Yeah, it's all fitting in into kind of like a, a piecework day. And I've had to work on figuring out what the right pacing and balance is to kind of keep me sharp and um, relatively happy in the work that I'm doing. And I found that just doing one thing for a long stretch of time is just not how my brain and body works. There has to be movement. And I try to get mm -hmm. a walk in there during the day um, when there's you know other artists that are there in the space or I'm having a studio visit that helps me to look at mm -hmm. other people's work and to have other people look at my work and see that. So it's kind of a lot of heads down time and then surfacing up and looking at my own work and other artists and then mm -hmm. um, just trying to to give a lot of variety to the pacing of my day. Mm -hmm. And we talked a bit about, you know, your residency up north and how that um, inspired you and influenced you. Um, your studio is in Ypsilanti right now at the moment, just just east of us a bit. Um, how how's that been? How do you find working in Ypsilanti? How do you find, you know, working with artists there? Um, how do you find that community going for you? I love my little community here. Um, I love being able to walk from my home to where I work and to really get to be in, 
in the city fully, spend my full days here. And that's kind of my ecosystem, um, especially in the pandemic, being able to kind of have my bubble and pod of artists that I see regularly was just really grounding and nourishing for me. I like to be with other people. I'm also an introverted person, kind of loves research and extended solo time. So for me, like from the extremes of two solo weeks on an island to kind of living in a city, like I like to be somewhere in the middle where I'm around people, but also having that um, time for myself to really focus and think through the work. But um, I love living in Michigan and I love being here and I, I love getting to make art every day. Like that's something I always dreamed about doing and being able to do that feels really special. So, you know, not a day goes by that I don't wake up and I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to make the work that lets me process the world and kind of be my best self um, in these times. So I feel really lucky and I love, I love it here. Oh, that's great. That, that's great. That seems like a good note to end on maybe that's a really great message of you know being thankful to make art every day so that's something maybe that can be a takeaway for all of us and even if you know even if you don't have a studio practice or a studio or you know it's been a while since you've made art you know just finding a few few moments to uh take some time to make art every day i think is really really um important it can, can really do a lot for you so that's a good note to leave on uh thank you so much avery for joining us this was a great Great chat, great talk. I love looking at your work. It's so nice to be able to spend, you know, an hour talking with you and all the time ahead of it, uh, you know, putting these slides together and, you know, combing through your website and really looking at everything. Um, so thank you. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, next week, we have a virtual tour of the current special exhibition by her hand, which is really great. Um, highly recommend checking it out. That'll be with Ray and Cindy. Um, and thank you to Ian and Amanda for helping out behind the scenes today. And thank you to Avery, and thanks to all of you for joining in. Thank you. Thank you.